So I, it's certainly my pleasure to introduce Professor Bill Sharp from MIT. Um, just a little bit about his background. Um, as I recall, the undergraduate degree was Union College in Kentucky. Some of you may remember last year's distinguished lecturer, George Whiteside, who also was from Kentucky. So uh, we're in a rut with people from Kentucky, <laughs> but uh, outstanding people from Kentucky. Uh, Phil then went on to do his PhD in chemistry at the University of Illinois in what they now call Urbana-Champaign, although I always call it Champaign-Urbana. <laughs> <laughs> and then a postdoc at Caltech, went to Cold Spring Harbor, and ended up at, uh, at MIT uh, relatively early in his career. Um, he has many awards. I'm not going to go over all the awards. Um, but he is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a member of the Institute of Medicine. Um, but probably most notable, in fact, very notable, is the fact that he received, was it 1993, you said, mm -hmm. uh, a Nobel Prize. And this was for work done back in uh, the mid-70s uh, on RNA splicing. And I think that was published in 1977, something like that. Uh, you know, in today's world, at that time, Phil would have been 33 years old. In today's world, if you're 33, you probably can't even get an NIH grant. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, it's the young people who are the future, and uh, uh, there are many other people who have got Nobel Prizes who did their work back in the early parts of their career. But it's a real pleasure to have Phil here. And I asked him this morning, not to talk about RNA, he'll talk about small RNAs at his lecture at 11 o'clock, which will be out in the atrium. But he has co-chaired a committee that basically started its work, I believe, last December. That's when the first workshop was held, at least. And their report is just being released. Uh, I actually have a pre-publication cop copy, but I think the real report is almost out off the printing press on new biology for the 21st century. So I thought it would be useful for this group to, to hear <coughs> what has come out of that committee in terms of where that committee thinks biology needs to go to serve mankind and do what needs to be done to address the problems of our worldwide society. So Phil, thank you for coming. We've got a mic because we're gonna videotape this so we can put it on our screen. So, thank all you, yours. Mark. <laughs> Thanks. It's a uh, pleasure to be able to visit Georgia Tech. It is surprising to me that over my career, and I've been at MIT 34 years, I haven't been here before. Uh, so uh, it's one of the three, as far as I'm concerned, three or four major technology universities in the country. There's two of them I've worked at. At Caltech, I was there for two years, and then at MIT for 34 years. And you can, Georgia Tech is next on that list. We might move them around. You might move them around. But <laughs> we call but MIT the Georgia Tech of the North. North okay, that's fine. <laughs> and then Carnegie Mellon. And, and uh, I just, uh, I'm very pleased uh, to be here, to see this community. I don't believe uh, the country needs technology schools more than it ever has before. It's uh, an essential part of what we're able to offer young people in terms of education, what we're able to offer the country in, ter in terms of taking technology and science uh, forward in, ter in terms of developing society. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, my own brief, a little bit more expanded uh, comments uh, about my time at MIT. I came to MIT in 74. MIT at that stage developed the cancer center and I went into a cancer center in 74. Uh, we then created the Whitehead in 83 that expanded life science. We then built a new biology building in 93, occupied. We then built a new neuroscience complex. We got a 45 faculty neuroscience complex. We, that was in 2000. We then built a Broad Institute that is uh, e. Eric Lander and the Broad Institute, uh, which is a Harvard-MIT collaboration. And we're just finishing the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. The last is a building that I'm moving into <coughs> from my original position in 94. And in that, very like this structure here, uh, about 12 
cell biologists and uh, engineers are going to move into a building and collaborate. On every floor, there will be three or four cell biologists and three or four engineers. And what's happened at MIT, which is apparently what's happened here as well, is engineering and life science have begun to integrate with each other. And about a third of all engineers at MIT are now engaged in life science. I think this is terribly exciting and, and relevant to what I'm going to comment about uh, the report that uh, Bob uh, mentioned. So it's really exciting to see this new complex, all these buildings uh, with people and doing great integrated biomedical bioengineering. <coughs> we were asked as a committee uh, last summer to, uh, I as a co-chair with Tom Conley, who's the senior technical officer at DuPont, to uh, form a committee to look at the issue of what investments in life science uh, would be best to make at this time, given what has happened in life science over the last 30, 40 years, and looking at societal needs in moving forward in terms of life science. And uh, this was led by the Board of the Life Science and Keith Yamamoto as head of that board. And we formed a committee that had you know, engineers like Doug Laufenberger at MIT and others, uh, physical scientists, computational scientists, biologists, ecologists, all uh, invited to participate on the committee. We held a summit, summit last fall in which leaders from around the country talked about what their thoughts were in terms of life science. As the committee began to talk and think about this, we look back at this, the evolution of, of biological science, at least at the molecular and cellular level, and said, you know, look, this whole field began in the 50s with Watson and Crick. Uh, it then advanced along through the 70s in which we got recombinant DNA, and then Around 2000, we began, 2003, we actually completed the human genome sequence. And what you see is an evolution and growth of our understanding how biological systems work. And with this integration of large databases and, and computational power and, and genomic sequences, beginning to change an enormous uh, uh, aspect of biological science. For example, we can now ask the question, which we've never asked before, how many organisms exist on your body? How many microbes exist on your body? We've never been able to ask that question before because we haven't been able to culture most of those organisms. You take them in the lab, they die. So we actually know there's some there. We don't know what the population are. But by simply taking all those organisms and sequencing the DNA, then by computation, we can begin to characterize how many are there. And there are more cells on your body than there are cells in your body. So there are more microbes that live on you than there are in you. And you're populated early as you're born, and you keep this ec ecological niche through your life. So we actually know very little about what it means in terms of disease, but it clearly is a major part of you as a biological organism. If I go to a plant, I have the same issue. There's an ecological niche around the plant. There's an ecological niche of microorganisms everywhere we look. So <coughs> this technology of being able to simple do a DNA sequence has opened an enormous amount of new arenas to biology, new genes we can discover, new things we didn't know. So <coughs> committee looked at this and said, what's new biology? And we then looked at the major societal challenges. I'll mention four. Uh, energy. How are we going to get sustainable energy that allows us to uh, you know, move around? Um, food. How are we going to feed 8 billion people? There's 6 billion people now. We anticipate 8 billion people in another 30 years, um, how are we going to food feed those people? Climate, how are we going to do the, the above two without significantly an altering and irreversibly altering the climate? <coughs> and health, 
How do we take advantage of all this knowledge and health about the biological organism of a human and translate that into uh, ways of preventing disease and more effectively treating disease? Those are four major challenges. If you think about them, they have a commonality. Commonality to them is that life science, I will hold, will be the most innovative force in solving all four challenges. So if that is true, then we had better start thinking about how to make investments in, in life science that have an impact on those four major, major challenges. So as we were thinking about that in that context, there is a l continuity of life science, um, of questions in life science that have uh, important implications for all four, four areas. And if you step back, let's talk about a few of these uh, uh, foundational, let's call them, sciences and technology. Uh, a foundational science, uh, if you think about it from this perspective, would be something like synthetic biology. As I mentioned before, we now have the ability to sequence organisms. Every time we sequence an organism, we by and large discover new genes. Those genes are there with a certain function. They become the matrix in which we can use to make new organisms doing new things. But to do that, we need to be able to synthetically produce uh, or manipulate uh, organisms. Both micro and multicellular organisms learn the principles of how this works. So synthetic biology, an area we are, we are, we're, we're ripe to be able to make major advances in. Uh, plant biology, we need an enormous increase in, a, in investment in plant biology. The country has underinvested in the molecular, genetic, and cellular aspects of plant biology. We made major progress. If you have Farley, who's the chief technical officer at Monsanto, come and give us a talk at the summit, uh, he talked about increasing crop yields uh, by selective genetics incorporating modern technologies to look at genotype the genetic makeup of plants after breeding. For 100 years now, we've increased the yield of plant productivity by 1% a year by just taking you know, plants with the best year of corn and take those seeds and plant them and cross them with this seed, a little bit more sophisticated now. Every year, we've increased the yield per acre by 1%. 10 years ago, genomics integrated with breeding, that's increased to 2%. 2% means we double yields every 30 years. 1% means we double yields every 70 years. But if you integrate phenotype, genotype, computation, and synthetic biology into that process, then we can change things. That yield should be able to go up. We should be able to produce plants that grow in environments where they can't grow now, crop plants. Talk about energy and biomass. We should be engineering plants who have the right constituents to be able to convert into biomass. So the whole biomass ethanol fermentation technology will be part impacted by how we understand plants. So plant biology, synthetic biology, all examples that impact across all those elements. Systems biology, dynamics. How can you understand how a system functions as a biological organism. This modeling, this is involved in large computational aspects and gives us the ability, if we can model as an engineer, then you can predict how things respond to changes and then you can control. So understanding dynamics and the science behind how microorganisms work is very, very uh, uh, important for all those areas of science. And then we look at foundational technologies integrated into, uh, <coughs> uh, into life science. And we 
picked a few examples that I will mention. Uh, obviously, one of those examples is computational science. I don't know about you here at Georgia Tech, but in biology at MIT, we're enormously challenged by being able to bring all the biological data that is being generated by massive parallel sequencing, mass spec, you know, microarray analysis, multi-gene analysis of disease states, normal states, the environment, bringing all that computational, all those databases to our desktop to actually think about how to do experiments and, and, and plan uh, and interpret results. It's, it's, it's going to take a change in our educational system to do that. Uh, to get biological scientists able to. The engineering tradition, computation, quantitation is much more common of your educational systems, and you're better prepared for that. But it is a challenge, and we need new computational tools to be able to illustrate that data, compare the data, uh, and extract information from it. So computation is a major, major qu question in this area. Um, Imaging and remote sensing, engaged in, in biological science. If you can see it, you can understand it. It's a, a very, very uh, a general principle uh, and will remain. If you can monitor it, you can, you can think about how to control it. Uh, microfabrication, the ability to take high throughput processes, make them micro, make them rapid and inexpensive, and automate it. Uh, and there are many applications of microfabrication to, to life science that's just going to grow by leaps and bounds in the future. Uh, one of the things we've learned in, in biology is you never measure one thing. If you can measure a thousand things at the same time, you typically get uh, much less expense, a lot more information, and you can extract insights from that. Microfabrication is the, the, the way that, that has to go. Uh, and it's going to be part of what happens. Uh, so we've looked at all these. We were looking at these foundational sciences, foundational technologies, and looked at our major societal needs and said, if we're going to make the advances at the pace we need to meet these societal needs, sustainable energy, increased food production, better control our understanding of climate change and how we can reduce CO2 effects, increased uh, uh, medical care. I should talk about the particular part of that we took, and that is uh, uh, affecting personalized medicine. <coughs> I mean, clearly this is something that is going to happen over the next decades. We're going to stop treating individuals as statistical entities where we can say, you know, 10% will respond or 50% will respond to a point where we understand enough about genotype and environment and medical condition that we can say this individual will respond to this drug with a very high confidence. And this individual won't respond to that drug, do not give them. Or this individual has a predilection to this problem, we should counsel them intensely on controlling this aspect of their life, maybe weight maybe other aspects of exposure, maybe monitoring them. Bringing personalized medicine to an individual is something that, that is going to require an enormous amount of computational information uh, and, and uh, new technology to, to bring it into existence. It's what's going to happen. It's the students in your medical classes today 40 years from now are going to have to practice medicine that way. And uh, being able to look at a genotype, talk about an environment, talk about how to integrate all that information in telling a patient something about how they should be treated. Your genomic sequence, I mean, it, it is, it's going to be below the cost of an MRI in a few years. So you can just think of how you use MRI now I think genomic information will be below the cost of an MRI in 10 years. So how are you going to use it? It's going to be a major, major issue. All these medical records, if we could integrate medical records and genomic information, 
we could un predict diseases and understand human causes of diseases, meaning that we could look at human genetic makeup as a scientific process and say, this gives you a predilection to that problem. There has to be a connection. How do we understand it and how do we go about treating it? So those are some of the, the foundational sciences and foundational technologies that the uh, committee looked at. And stepped back and said, we're not be going to be able to get to that point of impacting as we need to solve these societal problems unless we're able to bring computational scientists, physical scientists, engineers, and, and you know, biologists as well, uh, into these problems of life science. Um, we need to be able to bring their expertise into these problems, and we need to bring their expertise into these problems in a way that the scientists and engineers who are engaged will be comfortable and willing to, to be engaged. And that led us, and as well, the idea that there was uh, common science and common technologies that had to be developed to meet all four of these challenges. Yet there, the challenges themselves are organized in our capital in, in different ways, and I'll come to that. That this investment needs to be interagency. So let me tell you why. Health in this country is funded out of one committee in Congress in the Senate and the House. Energy is funded out of another. Agriculture out of another. And climate is left <laughs> to, of, to another. Each of these sciences, each of these major societal needs have a constituent in Congress, committee authority, and funds those elements and have supporters for those specific constituents. The common biological life science issues that need to be dealt with to as rapidly solve these challenges as we can are shared across all those challenges. So we need to take the expertise of NRH, integrate it with the, the physics and chemistry and, and others of DOE and NSF uh, and, and get a common working group where they can plan how to strategically advance, let's say, plant biology. You know where plant genome sequences are now, now maintained, stored, and, and, and processed? In the library in the National Institute of Health. That's where all genomic sequences, mostly to date, are processed and handled, and genomic-related sequences. So, there is a, a com, you know, there is a set of expertises that are agency specific that need to be shared across different agencies. So the idea of the, the report was we need to make an investment in these common biological life science issues, um, foundational technologies, foundational sciences that should be interagency. For example, plants, agriculture, maybe ag would take the lead. It would set up strategic planning committees that involved NIH, NSF, and DOE, put forth a proposal in terms of a series of uh, objectives that people would then respond to, scientists, engineers respond to with proposals that could be signed, could be funded out of interagency peer reviewed monitored by the Agriculture Department, and you could think of equivalents out of health, out of, uh, out of uh, energy, and out of NSF. So an interagency program, uh, an interagency program that we think to have an impact would need to be scaled between 200 to 500 million dollars a year in each of these four areas, two billion, uh, let's say, investment over 10 years per year. Um, we're confident that it would vastly accelerate the rate at which we meet these national challenges and that it would probably be the most prudent, and I, I wouldn't use, I shouldn't use the term probably, 
uh, we're confident it would be the most um, effective leverage investment the country could make in terms of advancing life science and having an impact on all of these, these four areas. So that's the, the conclusion of the committee. Uh, the report was pre-released uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, we're in the process of talking to various uh, federal agencies about this, uh, OSTP, PCAST, uh, the executive uh, science advisor uh, in the government, um, trying to see if we can get uh, the various agencies to support it and to uh, have uh, an effective interagency process that would accelerate the rate of development of these uh, areas of science. So um, that's, that's where we're at. Um, I think it comes down at what's happening here at Georgia Tech and what's happening a few other places where we're seeing life science and engineering integrate and, and address major societal problems. And I am totally confident that this integration will be of more importance 10 years from now and 20 years from now even more and 30 years from now even more. We're in a, that moment in our s culture and society in which life science is beginning to take on uh, a level of, of understanding and, and components that we can now more effectively address than we ever have uh, societal issues and, and make contributions to. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Let's take some time for questions, discussion, comments. Mm -hmm. Every so often, the notion of a unified <coughs> Department of Science pops up. So we pull the science out of the various agencies. Do you see that as a potentially effective way to achieve the integration you're looking for? Well, well it. Well, the, a uniform department of, of science um, suffers from some of the same issues that we see with NSF. Um, it's too abstract to capture the attention of the citizens of the country in terms of understanding how our science and engineering impacts on their lives. So uh, I, live, I have lived most of my career in NIH. And NIH's budget now is $35 billion plus or minus a few billion on the edges, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, and uh, why has that happened? Well, s life science has flourished and lots of new insights uh, have happened. And you know, there's been a lot of uh, advances in medical care due to it. But really, it has happened because there have been constituents in the society such as the American Cancer Society, the Multiple Sclerosis Society, and others who have been proponents of making investment in science to solve specific societal problems. And the same is true in energy, and the same is true in ag. So um, I think we have a very effective way to engage the, the country, citizens of the country, in supporting science. Uh, and I would hate to step back to a, a situation where it would be much more difficult for the average person to see how an investment in those egghead scientists <laughs> is going to impact on their, on, on their lives. So uh, from a pure science point of view, I think we are seeing you know, more commonality between our various areas of science. We can talk to each other. We have physicists who are moving into our biology buildings at MIT now. We have to keep the physicists out. We didn't have trouble with physicists. <laughs> we now have trouble with physicists. We've got to keep the physicists out. Uh, but, uh, but I just don't believe it's a, uh, an effective way to, to fund. And this whole idea of individual predictive medicine mm -hmm. that may in 10 years be at a lower cost than an MRI. As you your genome sequence, genome I said. <laughs> I said specifically your genome sequence. Do you see that as a potential way to bring down the health cost of health care? And has there been anything that's really been put together to study that issue? Um, I don't, 
I would love to be able to say I think we'll be able to bring down the cost of health care. I think we are probably uh, reaching a plateau where we can't go higher. <laughs> All right. So let's assume that is the case, that the country is investing about 16% of its GDP in health care in one way or another. I think what personalized medicine will do is produce better quality health care at that level. And if we don't keep innovation into health care, we won't be able to get better quality health care at that cost. So um, I'm, I'm confident it's going to produce better quality health care. It, it's the issue of, of how we integrate that technology into the system, displacing other technologies and other things the medical community does to maintain, you know, to, to be able to deliver that better quality health care. But if we don't, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, go to uh, our, our, you know, clinical center, take a little blood from us, get a thousand different readouts as to, you know, components in the blood, and then use that to monitor our, our, our health along with our genome uh, and our histories, uh, we will, you know, we won't be advancing uh, the quality of health care. Where do you see the U.S. and the technology rates? I mean, are we, are we still the leaders of the world in body all to come? Or do you feel like that the, the uh, emergence of China and Korea and you know, other, other countries that are interested in investing heavily in, in science and technology will supersede us at some point? Um, it's a very interesting question. Um, I'll answer it in multiple different ways. Um, we have a remarkably high standard of living in this country compared to many other parts of the world. Uh, we are a technology-based science, uh, technology-based community. Our citizens accept technology. They believe in innovation and technology more than I think any other country, maybe Japan, probably a little bit more, maybe Asia beginning to. Uh, so, and we are a high cost area. We cannot sustain ourselves in manual, in manufacturing and, and production of that way. The only way we are going to be able to sustain ourselves is to be innovative and to bring forth new products and new opportunities. So if we lose that edge <laughs> over a period of time, we will lose a, a lot of our standard of living. Um, we're leading now. Uh, does that mean that, that m you know, most of these discoveries in, in the next 20 years will be in the U.S., technology transfer in the U.S.? No, it means probably a major fraction of them, maybe five times more per capita than the rest of the world. But clearly, China is making an enormous investment. Japan has already made a big investment. Europe has been strong for a long time, not nearly as innovative as we are in moving technology into the marketplace. So um, I think if you look at the integrated picture, we're, we're far ahead. Uh, we have to be far ahead. And that we will see challenges uh, to that innovation uh, in the next decades. And if we allow the rest of the world to go green before we go green, we're going to really have a problem, all right? Because we're going to be buying technology from the rest of the world that's driving the standard of living in this country. So we need to go green, and we need to go green well. And it's one of the things this committee is uh, talking, trying to address from a fundamental science perspective. So the genome sequencing provides a huge um, diagnostic power. Um, but uh, how, how do you see the funding of treatment development will occur with the commercialization uh, for small sector would be very difficult? They're not very attractive for the pharmaceutical industry. So is the government just going to play a bigger role in developing treatment uh, based on the um, it's a, it's really an interesting, interesting question. Um, how to uh, see with the regulatory system we have and the structure of our pharmaceutical industry and our medical industry, how to bring this personalized medicine into I existence. Um, and I think the first place this is really uh, coming into focus is in cancer research. Uh, we now know that 
cancer has to be treated if it's going to be effectively treated as a personalized disease, even a cancer-specific disease. We're, we're, we're soon going to be in a position where we're going to sequence. Uh, well, Mass General has already made the announcement. Every cancer they get, they're going to sequence. The, you know, the, the known oncogenes and look at whether they can plan their treatment around sequencing. That was a public announcement. Several other places are, are beginning to, to uh, approach cancer that way. If you look at innovations, the scientific community is driving the innovations in therapeutics through known changes and pathways that, that they can treat, Gleevec and HER2 and, and all, all those pathways. Uh, so, and yet to actually register a new treatment in a cancer even directly personalized is something like a half a billion dollars to go through a clinical trial. Um, so we're going to, to need to find a way, and traditionally it's been register in one disease where you, one type of cancer, one genotype of cancer, show a response, a, and then by using genetics, oncologists will use it off-label <laughs> and, and treat the uh, diseases that show the same genotype changes where it, types of cancer same, show the same genotype changes, but where it hasn't been shown to be effective in that cancer. So um, I, that's where the science is going. I think that's where the, 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 the regulatory system is going. It'll, it'll be driven that way. Uh, how that goes and how that uh, is taken into account in in drugs like for cardiology, a, a, a cholesterol lower or whatever, uh, I think those are big enough markets that if you parse out 20% that responds very well, you'll capture value for that 20% that'll be worth the, the investment in developing the drug. Sally, uh, did the committee try to anticipate ethical issues that are going to be raised by what it's, uh, what it's recommending? It did. Um, we d we um, the committee discussed those issues, and there's uh, a recommendation that uh, part of this investment be uh, uh, committed to uh, public education around issues that that will arise from it, um, and. Uh, you know, discussion of, of these issues, but more a public outreach about what the technology and what the, the possible impact on people's lives are. The committee spent more time, and I should have said this, about looking at education in the country and saying what should be done in education, what needs to be done in education to make this happen. And um, I think the, the, the major thrust of what the committee said that has been said many times before is you need better science and better, you know, mathematics in, in K through 12. And, and then more specifically, the committee said, students who are going to medical school, graduate school in life science, trained undergraduate life science, need to have more skills in computation. We need to, to require students who are in the biology department <laughs> to be computationally literate. All right, and graduate students need to be computationally. If they're not, they're not going to be able to do science in this field. So it's just something you're going to have to do to, you know, affect, prepare students for the future. Um, and we called for more commitment to education, uh, and particularly in computation and quantitative skills. How do you see changing the, uh, the medical education system for physicians? the science, to be able to integrate the complexities of science into routine practice? Uh, I'm, a, I'm of the school that if you train an individual to read, critically think, uh, and discover for themselves, you, you've prepared them for a life of, of learning. And, and, uh, and that prepares you for a professional career where things are going to change so enormously over decade by decade that, that you can't recognize where you came from <laughs> when you're in it. 
So um, I would only say that, that one of the challenges is going to be for those students who are going into medicine and practicing medicine over the coming decades is this issue of being able to handle computationally and databases and to be able to, to use that information 10 years from now, 20 years from now, to think about medical problems, think about their patients, think about how to talk to them. And, and they need to have a stronger computational background than we're giving most of our medical students. And that's going to be the same for a GP practicing out in, you know, someplace in the countryside. He's going, he or she is going to have to, to think about these things. Bill, let me pick up on Nick's question and raise a related one. So in this world of new biology, we can foster it through interdisciplinary institutes like this one and like many that you have at MIT. What do you see ultimately being the change in the university itself? Because although we foster these things with interdisciplinary institutes, you stick with the same traditional disciplines. What kind of changes do you see? I would only change your last statement slightly. Okay. We stick with the same departments. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, not the same disciplines. Not same the same, department. the same departments. Um, and I've sort of, I grew up at MIT in terms of being an, an academic uh, uh, scientist and administrative leader and that sort of thing. Um, and we sort of have a very good, solid working system. We have very strong departments. Um, chemistry and physics and biology and engineering, civil and others. Uh, we create a few departments in engineering. Biological engineering is now a new department. Chemical engineering was created decades ago. We um, have very strong disciplines in which we teach students in those disciplines the history, tradition, critical thinking, state of the art at an undergraduate level and then at a graduate level. Everything we do beyond that is interdisciplinary. <laughs> Our research is interdisciplinary. We, reach, we live in different institutions. We walk to the department headquarters. Um, I'm very, uh, so I think that's the way we solve this problem have a strong traditional background, but have a very interdisciplinary uh, environment where a lot of resources come into the interdisciplinary parts of the institute, the research institutes and centers, that influence the department in hiring. Uh, but uh, the department is really structured around its educational role and its disciplinary role. Um, and that's work for us. Uh, Will it work? The next it, years. Well, I worked through the computer revolution, the core of the computer. I worked through, you know, software and <laughs> worked through biotech. Um, I, I don't think, uh, I think, okay, let me say it the other side. When there's a, a body of information and education subjects that you can transmit to a student and prepare them for you know, deep thinking and critical learning in a discipline and enough faculty come together to support that student, I think you can create a new department. I mean, it's, it's, it's nothing, you know, uh, impossible. It's not, it's, not, it's, it's not difficult to do. Uh, I like departments that have 40 or 50 people in them, <laughs> right? I, I like departments big enough that the department can evolve without ever having to dissolve a unit. Right? I mean, we, we have a department of about 50 in biology, and we've gone from molecular biology only to, you know, cell biology, cancer biology, moving into computation engineering genomics, and we've never dissolved anything. <laughs> we've just hired a few people over here and didn't hire a few people over here and over there and changed over time. If you've got departments of 10, then you really, uh, you, to change that department, you almost have to lift up a, a whole new department in its place. So I like a, a little larger department, a license to change, uh, and a lot of interdisciplinary uh, collaboration to influence uh, the department hiring. Michelle? You mentioned international competition. Yeah. Does the committee talk at all about international collaboration in these roles? 
we did. Um, and, um, you know, this, obviously this science, uh, particularly where we're talking about making increased investments, is science that will uh, advance, um, inter, you know, internationally uh, progress on these, these problems. Um, if you talk about energy, if we can solve the energy, sustainable energy problem, make major contributions here, it'll impact the whole world because we're all in suffering with this issue uh, together. Climate is the same. Uh, food, uh, plant biology, we need to be able to grow plants in environments where, at this moment, food plants uh, that you can't you know, get uh, uh, adequate nourishment. It's one of the major challenges. So, uh, in fact, these investments will have uh, an enormous impact internationally uh, in solving these problems, because they're actually international problems. Any other questions? Todd? Mm -hmm. Genome's fairly static in the sense in that it's not changing much in an individual or in cells. There's a lot of other things that constantly are, like the upstream of that and the genetics and downstream of that RNA process. How do you see that integrating into this? Because there's a much more dynamic nature of which all of this is occurring. And how does that play into genome? When I, when I use genome, I mean <laughs> approaches to biological problems that, that use genomic type technology. And, and that clearly now uh, is looking at the epigenetic genome uh, and looking at the expressed genome in terms of RNA. Um, and as you, from the nature of your question, know, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is changing the way we, we do research uh, in our laboratories now. It's really one of the most rapidly um, changing areas of science and cell biology. Uh, because we can just see things we've never seen before, and then we can integrate them. Okay. Bill, thank you very much. Thank you.